Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for John McCaskill. Woo! All right, thank you so much. I don't know how to set this clock, but I have a clock on my phone here, so I'm just gonna go by that. I want you to uh, imagine that it's 2.15 a.m. and you're getting woken up. This was a scenario I was in as a first time father. 2.15 a.m., three weeks into my first time fatherhood, and I'm embarrassed to admit that I was a little frustrated that I was getting up at 3 a.m., 2.15 a.m., 3.30 a.m. the next night to feed my three-week-old daughter, doing what a three-week-old daughter does, crying when she's hungry. And I would go through and I'd warm up the bottle and I would be feeding her. And while I'm holding this beautiful little miracle in my hands, what I'm thinking about is the next day at work and what I had to do at work or the day before at work and what I had screwed up. And now I've work myself into this frenzy, and I take this beautiful little miracle and I put her back in the crib, and I go back to bed, but I don't go back to sleep because I'm stewing. Then, fast forward two months, and I've been practicing mindfulness and meditation, and I hear my girl, my little girl cry, and I'm excited. I'm like, yes, this is an opportunity for me to go and spend some time with her alone when the world is quiet. And I go through and I warm up the bottle and I go through to her, pull her out of the crib, and I put her in my arms and I pay attention to the little noises that she's making. And I pay attention to her reaching up with her tiny little fingers and grabbing my thumbs and my fingers and the little noises that she's making, right? And then when I'm done feeding her, spend a little extra time with her and then I put her down in her crib and I go back to bed and what happens? I go back to sleep because I have not worked myself into that frenzy. And that's what mindfulness and meditation has done for me. Now. That all said, I want you guys to stand up real quick. I want you to find somebody in the room, pair up with them, and I want you to turn to them and say one nice thing to them about them. One nice thing. Hey Mac, you don't get out of this. Find somebody. <laughs> you can pair up, make a trio right here. We'll, we'll have a three way. There you go. <laughs> All right. Don't, don't go sit down, don't go anywhere. All right, now what I want you to do, I want you to turn to that same person, I want you to tell them one nice thing, one more nice thing. But this time, here's the catch I want you to make it about yourself. Yep, that's normally the response I get. Total silence. <laughs> Total fear, and I know is it, Tracy just walked us through that tapping and relaxed us, and now I'm amping you guys up. Don't worry, we'll bring you back down. One nice thing about yourself. You got great accents. You can do the great. Somebody from the country. Ah, you rat, you rat, buddy. I don't know what I was thinking. All right, when, you got, when you're done with that, go ahead and return back to your seats. <laughs> now, much like Tracy just did and had you kind of do a, an inventory of how you felt in your body, your mind, and your nervous system before we did the EFT, I want you to take a snapshot, an internal selfie, if you will. Take a snapshot. Imagine taking a phone and taking a snapshot of yourself in your body, in your mind, and in your nervous system, how you feel in all three of those, okay? After saying something nice about the person that you know better than anybody on the planet, yourself. You may feel a little anxious. I know when I go to church on Sunday and the pastor says, I want you to stand up and say hello to the person next to you, that's my least favorite part of my week. Right? And I love church. I love church, but I hate that because I, like Kathy, Funny enough, I'm a speaker, but I'm an introvert, and I cannot stand just saying something, to, saying something like hello to the person next to me. So I ramped you up for a reason, because now I'm gonna bring you back down, all right? So what I want you to do is close your eyes if you're comfortable doing so, and I want you to do nothing else besides focusing your attention on your breath. You don't have to force it, don't have to count. I want you just to notice the physical attributes of your inhalation, and your exhalation. Intentionally pay attention to the rise 
and fall of your belly and chest as you inhale and as you exhale. And notice how that air feels as you inhale, maybe slightly cooler versus how it feels as you exhale, maybe slightly warmer. And notice where it is entering your body. Maybe as you inhale, it might be coming through your nostrils. Maybe, maybe notice and pay attention to the tips of your nostrils as you breathe in. And as you breathe out, if you're breathing out through your mouth, maybe notice the air passing out past your lips. Couple more. Inhale and exhale. All right, now go ahead and open your eyes, come back into this space. How do you feel now? That internal selfie, maybe slightly different. I heard a yawn. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> That's a good thing. All right, so what I did there, we talked about the nervous system. Uh, Tracy, I heard you talking about that before, and Kathy, I know you referenced it before. There's a lot of overlap in what you two speak about and what I speak about. The nervous system is broken down, the autonomic nervous system is bro broken down in the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is controlled by the amygdala. That is what's there for the fight, fight, or freeze. It's to defend us from that saber-toothed tiger, right? right? When we were cavemen and women, back in the day, when we would go out, yes, it's great to assume that if I go around this corner, to assume that there's a saber-toothed tiger there and be wrong, not a problem. But if I assume the reverse, if I go around this corner and I assume that there's no saber-toothed tiger, and I go around this corner and, oh, there is one, that's the end of me and probably the end of humanity, right? Well, that's there to defend us, to defend us and humanity writ large. Now, the other side of the nervous system, the parasympathetic side, that's what calms us down. So when I had you guys introduce yourselves and say something nice about the other person and then say something nice to, to them about yourself, your amygdala kicked in, your sympathetic system ramped up and you got anxious. Then I had you breathe and your parasympathetic nervous system kicked in and you calmed back down. So that's why I did that. The other reason I do it is because I get nervous right in front of a crowd and that gives me an opportunity to literally calm myself down right before your very eyes. Now, a little background about me. Bobby touched on it. Uh, I, I grew up in South Africa, actually. I was born in Cape Town, South Africa. And I moved to the States when I was seven years old. My parents left South Africa in 1984 to bring me and my siblings, specifically me and my younger brother, over to the States to get away from the military draft. <laughs> and then I voluntarily enlisted in the Navy after going through high school in Ruston, Louisiana. I enlisted in the Navy, got picked up from the enlisted ranks, went to, th to the Naval Academy, graduated in 2001, and went into Navy SEAL training, basic underwater demolition SEAL training, BUDS. That's a six month long program out in sunny Coronado, California. Beautiful spot right outside the Hotel Del Coronado. Mm -hmm. But somehow the instructors still find a way to make it a living hell. But anyhow, fast forward, I, I served my 17 years uh, after that in the SEAL teams or special operations in some capacity. And now I do what a, love, a lot of Navy SEALs do, and that is public speaking, but I speak on something slightly different than mo what most Navy SEALs speak on, and that's this hippy-dippy, woo-woo meditation and mindfulness stuff. So the question always comes up, like, how did you go from being a special operator into teaching mindfulness and meditation? So in 2005, I was involved in, a, in an operation that went horribly wrong, and we ended up losing 19 men. And... I was actually not on the battlefield for that. I wanted to be on the battlefield. I was on the radio and I was on the phones and I was on the computer and I heard all this happening. And where was I? I was sitting behind a desk. And I returned from that deployment with a lot of moral injury, survivor's guilt, why them and not me? Why me and not them? Those types of things. And I carried that with me and I self-medicated with alcohol and prescription medication for years. And I got to a point where I actually considered some very dark options. And I went and saw this counselor. I'm gonna steal this chair for a second here, Tawny. Okay. I went and saw this counselor, and this counselor sits across the table from me. He says, I want you to try something. I want you to try mindfulness and meditation for me. And I laughed at him. I said, Doc, I've got 
some real stuff going on. I, I, need, I need some medicine. I need medication, not meditation. And he says, okay, well, what if I had a pill that I could give to you that would change the way that you perform? Change the way that you perform physically and mentally, personally and professionally. And as a Navy SEAL, as a special operator, as a military member, you're always looking for an edge. You're looking for an edge over your enemy on the battlefield or you're looking for an edge over your buddy right next to you. You're looking for an edge. So heck yeah, doc, whatever that pill is, give it to me. Well, it wasn't a pill. As you can imagine, it's, it's meditation. So he kind of tricked me. I'm like, okay, gotcha, doc. Now you're speaking my language. I'm going to try this meditation. So as a type A personality, the next day, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to crush this meditation. <laughs> and I sit down for this hour-long meditation. Day one. <sighs> All right, bring my attention to my breath, focusing on my breath, focusing on my breath. I've got to pay my taxes. I've got to change my oil on my truck. I've got to pick up my dog mess in the yard. My mind was on anything except this meditation. So I go back to this doc and I'm frustrated now. I'm like, doc, this meditation stuff, it's exactly what I thought it was. It's hippy dippy woo woo. It doesn't work. He says, well, what did you do? And I tell him what I just told you. He says, John, you can't do that. That's like lining up at the starting line of a marathon without ever having run a step before or like going into the weight room and getting under 350 pounds on the bench press without ever having lifted weights before. I've never been able to bench press 350 pounds. I just put that out there. But anyhow, now he's speaking my language. I'm like, docs, what do I do? And he says, I want you to stop and I want you to breathe in for a count of four, hold for a count of four, breathe out for a count of four, and hold for a count of four. And he says, that's called box breathing. You do it four or five times. I'm like, doc, we do that on the shooting range. We do that before we go into what we call the kill house, which I know is kind of an ugly term, but that's where we learn to clear a house. Anyhow, we do that. We just call it tactical breathing. We don't call it meditation. We don't call it mindfulness. We don't call it breath work, which is just tactical breathing. But now I've done it. So now I leave his office, and I get cut off by some jerk in traffic. I'm like, oh, maybe I should try this box breathing. So I try it out. All right, all right. It's calming me down. So then later, uh, you know, something else happens and it stresses me out. So I try the box breathing and it calms me down. And then I started to do it regularly. And then I started to do longer and more in-depth meditations. And they started to calm me down and they changed me. And I think, Kathy, you were talking about, about earlier, somebody came up to you. And, and they said something about how you were acting differently, right? Somebody came up to me and <laughs> they put their arm around me at work and they pulled me aside. They're like, John, what are you taking? <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm not taking anything. And now, now there's a little bit of fear and anxiety in me. I'm like, I'm gonna tell this guy that I'm meditating and he's gonna, his eyes are gonna kind of glaze over. He's gonna turn around and he's gonna walk away and never talk to me again. But what happens is he's like, oh really? Tell me more about that. So I started telling him and he actually started becoming a mindfulness practitioner as well. And it changed him. And mindfulness and meditation changed my life for the better. And I've seen it change other people's lives for the better. It quite literally saved my life. So that's why I now teach mindfulness and meditation. It is a duty and an obligation to pay it forward so that I can change and potentially even save other people's lives. So that's how I got from being a special operator to doing what I do now. So I say mindfulness and meditation. A lot of the time you hear those terms used synonymously. I personally do not believe they are the same. Mindfulness is a way of living. I'm a math major. You guys remember Venn diagrams, the circles, so you got one circle over here with something in it, another circle over here, and then we're in the intersect and unions and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Mindfulness is in this circle. Mindfulness is a way of living. It's a way of being. It's being present in the here and now, paying attention to what you're experiencing physically and emotionally without any judgment. That last piece is key because a lot of us judge ourselves for the feelings and emotions that we experience without judgment. Meditation is in the other circle. That's a formal practice where you practice this focus on an anchor of some point, an anchor of some kind. That could be your breath. That could be a mantra. It could be a body scan, which we're going to run through here shortly. Maybe not because we don't really have time. <laughs> So that's the meditation. And then the two overlap in mindfulness meditation. And you can practice and live mindfully, and that's gonna improve your meditation practice. And you can practice meditation, and that's gonna improve your living mindfully. They do complement one another. All right, so the science behind it, what's actually happening? Because Tracy was talking about people need to see the data, right? I, I, I started practicing, I went back to that doc, I'm like, hey man, what's actually happening here? Like, why, why does this work? He said, well, when you sit down and you start to think about your taxes and changing the oil in your truck and everything else, 
and then you bring yourself back and you bring yourself back and you bring yourself back over and over and over, that's actually where the magic happens. It's like doing a mental push-up of some sort. You're strengthening your focus muscle. You're strengthening the, thick, the lining between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain responsible for rational thought. You're also tapping into that parasympathetic side of your nervous system, calming yourself down. So that's what's happening, is you're learning to focus and you're learning to calm your body, your mind, and your nervous system down. Now, I often get the question, well, I'm too busy. I wake up at 5 a.m. and I'm running and gunning until midnight. I just don't have time to squeeze something else into my day. How am I supposed to meditate? I guarantee you, many of us waste a lot of time on these things. <laughs> these phones, right? We wake up with them, we use them as our alarm clocks, and after hitting snooze two or three times, then we roll over and what do we do? We check social media, we check our emails, we check the news, we check everything, and now we've burned up 20, 25 minutes before we've even gotten out of bed. You have time. Now, if you truly are just maxed out in your day, maybe you may not have time for meditation, like 15, 20, 60 minutes of meditation, but maybe you can do a mindful minute here and there. As you're driving to work, two, three minutes before you're done driving, turn off the radio, tune into the physical sensations that you're experiencing. Pay attention to the steering wheel in your hand. Pay attention to the seat against your back and against your butt. Pay attention to the sounds of the wheels rolling. Take a few breaths when you pull into that parking lot. Get out of your vehicle, you're gonna feel completely different than you did the day before. Then do it the reverse on your way home. You can leave work at work when you get home so that you can be more present and guess what that is? That's mindfulness, right? So you can do it in different ways. You can have a mindful meal. So many of us these days, we sit behind a computer and we wolf down our burger and fries while we're working in front of a computer, while we have the TV on in the background and while we're on the phone. That's the exact opposite of mindfulness. Put your phone down, turn the TV off, step away from the computer, go have a mindful meal, paying attention to the meal that is in front of you, expressing gratitude for that meal that is in front of you. Because it didn't just conjure up on that plate. It did not. People help to get it there. Spirit, some type of spirit, I don't know what your guys' religious beliefs are necessarily, helped to get it there, right? That we have to express that gratitude. So that's how and when we can do it, even in our busy days. Now that said, I wanna run you guys through a quick meditation. Uh, <coughs> Tracy helped to calm you down with the tapping, now I'm gonna help to calm you down with, with a meditation. And this is just gonna look like a quick body scan, okay? So. I invite you to, if you're comfortable, and I, I will preface this too, uh, I know a lot of us do have our own uh, spiritual and faith uh, beliefs. This is not here to change that in any shape, form, or fashion. Uh, whatever your spiritual beliefs are, religious beliefs are, this is completely secular. This is just going to be focused on a body scan from head down to toe and back up. Quick, nice and, nice and uh, simple. But if you are uncomfortable because of any reason, and then I invite you to just sit there. You don't have to follow along at all. You can just sit there and, and experience mindfulness in a separate way, all right? So go ahead and get comfortable, whatever that looks like for you. And if closing your eyes feels comfortable, then I invite you to do so. Otherwise, just soften your eyelids, soften your gaze. And let's bring your attention to the very crown of your head, noticing the physical sensations in the crown of your head. and the crown of your head only. And scanning down into your forehead, your temples, your eyeballs, your jaw, Noticing the physical sensations in your jaw. Not feeling the need to necessarily change anything, but just being aware of them. Scanning down into your neck and your throat. Your shoulders. And from your shoulders, shoot out to the very tips of your fingers 
noticing the physical sensation in the tips of each of your fingers. Scanning back into your hand, front and back, your wrists, elbows, your upper arms, and into your shoulders again. Scanning from your shoulders down into your chest and upper back. Upper abdomen and middle back. Lower abdomen, lower back. Continue focusing on the physical <coughs> sensations, scanning down into your pelvic bowl, your thighs, front and back, knees, shins and calves, your ankles, noticing the physical sensation in your heels, scanning forward, moving forward to the balls of your feet and each toe all the way to the tips of your toes. And now scanning quickly all at once from your toes to the balls of your feet, the heels, ankles, calves, shins, knees, thighs, front and back, pelvic bowl, lower back, and lower abdomen, middle back, middle abdomen, chest and upper back, shoulders, shooting out to your fingertips, scanning back from your fingertips into your whole hand, front and back, wrists, forearms, elbows, upper arms, shoulders, neck, jaw, your eyeballs, your temples, and to the crown of your head again. And we'll conclude with one deep cleansing breath together. Begin by exhaling all the way, emptying your lungs, holding empty at the bottom. Nice deep breath in, in through your nose, starting with your belly into your chest. Hold at the top and let that out with a nice sigh. And as you do, wiggle your fingers, bring some movement back into your body. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a quick body scan. Now, how does that feel? Feels feel good? No, nobody fell asleep? All right. Uh -huh. Well, that is mindfulness and meditation for you. And uh, I'll conclude by letting you know if, uh, if you're here today and you text the word mindful, M-I-N-D-F-U-L-L, -L, M I N D F U L, not double L, sorry, just one L, um, to 33777. So that's 33777. You'll get added to my uh, weekly mailing list, which has mindful tips, mindful resources. Uh, it includes links to my podcast called Men Talking Mindfulness. And it will also give you a link to purchase my short 
book, 65 pages, quick, easy read. You can sit, sit down and read it in one setting. So that's mindful to 33777. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all I have to say about that. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Give it up for John one more time, everybody. Thank you.